You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Pixies formed in Boston, Massachusetts in 1986 by Charles Thompson and Joey Santiago. The two of them met as sweetmates at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. They put an ad in the Boston Phoenix looking for a female vocalist, and Kim Deal was the only one who responded. Deal's husband introduced them to drummer David Lovering, solidifying their lineup. They began playing around Boston when producer Gary Smith offered to record a demo. Ivo Watts Russell of the label 4AD heard the tapes, and signed them to a contract. Come On Pilgrim, an EP of their selected demos, was released in 1987. For their first full-length album, Watts Russell suggested engineer Steve Albini, who met them in Boston, and they began recording the next day. Surferosa was eventually released in 1988. In this episode, for the 35th anniversary, Joey Santiago, David Lovering, and Steve Albini reflect on how the album came together. This is The Making of Surfer Rosa. Hey, my name is Joey Santiago. And I'm here to talk about Surferosa. Charles and I were sweet mates. So I met him and he was, uh, he had his acoustic guitar and he was writing these uh, wacky songs. I didn't have my guitar on purpose because I wanted to get a good start on um, grades, my grades. But as it turned out, I got 1.7. I did a lot of mescaline, so that was not good. That was not a good semester. But I did pick up my uh, guitar mid-semester. But I remember him playing uh, his acoustic guitar and spitting in the mirror uh, of the bathroom, and I liked that. I go, okay, well, I, um, I could relate to that. And we showed each other our album collections. So that's how we bonded, you know musically i remember having a stereo and then putting in mono so he could have one speaker and i could have the other if he chose to listen to it (laughs) but um anyway um charles and i we actually had letter exchanges for what he sent me in puerto rico and i found the letters uh recently it's pretty cool you know it just said that we got to start the band now i was like yeah sure let's do it So we were in Boston. We dropped out of UMass. We were roommates for a good while. We put an ad out on the Boston Phoenix, which is like the LA Weekly here, wanting a female vocalist, no chops, into Husker Du and Peter Paul and Mary. Perfect. Yeah. No snobs allowed. No musical snobs. No hipsters. Kind of getting rid of them. Too. Kim was the only one that answered. Yes, she was the only one. We got introduced to David from Kim because uh, Kim was married at the time and her husband worked with Dave at Radio Shack. And they said that they, he drummed, so we got him in. That's it. Hi, this is David Lovering from the Pixies. Kim answered an ad that Charles and Joe put out looking for a bass player. They were looking for a drummer. And then Kim being married to John, John made the suggestion of me. And that's how I became involved. 
Well, I remember meeting them. I went to Kim's apartment. It was Charles, Joe, and Kim, myself. John was there, her, her husband at the time. And I didn't have any drums, and Charles just played acoustic guitar to me to the songs they were he was uh, he had come up with, and I think they were all like Ed is dead, maybe Nimrod's son, songs like that. And to me, I mean, I was a background of like Rush. I mean, Rush was my my kind of background, and some alternative kind of I would say new wave is what I was as also synth pop, and um, so. Um, it was very eye-opening and very different for me to listen to those songs being being laid out for me. And I remember just playing, you know, just hitting, playing on top of the, the table or something, just going along with it. But I got along with them and everything, and then I learned to, I mean, open my eyes and really appreciate what the music was. And, um, yeah, it changed me completely as far as music in a way. I mean, I was very busy on drums, I think the first album, or at least playing live, which was, and that's all because of Rush. And it wasn't because of playing and realizing what these songs really are. I had gone less is more, less is more, less is more, just to, to accommodate the songs. Musically, we could have expanded on an idea, but no, let's just stay here. Let's keep it. You know, my guitar parts, a lot of people go, oh yeah, those are the notes. Why don't you fool around with it some more? No, that's it. That's what I got, man. We had our sound already. That was it. Uh, we were doing those songs live well before we recorded it, just because we had to have a 40-minute set. So um, we recorded it. And that's like the old school way of doing things. I wish we could do that now, you know, work on songs and then record them. Anyways, I miss those days. We recorded a demo. I think it was like 20 some odd songs. And eight of them were chosen to uh, be on Come On Pilgrim. And a lot of the other ones ended up on Surferosa. Yes, yeah, Surferosa was uh, recorded very quickly because we have played it a ton. We have played those songs live before we even went in there and we've been practicing it obviously and then uh, testing them out live so it was already proven that it was going to be good you know we were selling out shows already and we know how to edit ourselves prior to even like going in there we were editing it and whittling it down to uh, what surfer rosa sounds like i mean surfer rosa actually is my favorite pixies album and I think it's just because, you know, um, we did Come On Pilgrim first, which was a demo, really. Then Surfer Rosa, which was our first venture into, like, a real studio, like, rather than Fort Apache. So that was a big thrill. And this all being new to us when we were young, it was just, yeah, a big thrill. Considering, you know, Come On Pilgrim was, you know, demos we've been playing around Boston a bit. We knew how to play them well. Surfer Rosa, same. We kind of worked out these songs, kind of knew them well. It was easy, really comfortable and easy and, you know, gave you a confidence going in and recording them because you knew them well. And it's funny because I think Surfer Rosa was just, for some reason, the sound of it and just that era is like nostalgic. That's why I, I think it's my favorite album. Surfer Rosa was the album that uh, introduced us to the world. And, well, we had a producer that we weren't familiar with at all. And... You know, we're still a young band. Really, anytime someone's recording us was a pleasure. So I can't really say anything what was going on in my head, like, oh my God, we're going to do an album for a label now. It's like, it doesn't matter. You know, that doesn't really matter. And what matters is that, you know, we're trying not to embarrass ourselves. That's always what the goal is. 4AD suggested Steve Albini to us. And we said, yes, of course. They could have suggested anybody, really, you know. Uh, but Ivo had an ear out for uh, this guy's sound, and it turned out to be a, a great match. I don't know what his credits were, but I did like Big Black. You know, I love that uh, sound he had. Yeah, that was our first uh, producer. And I mean, that was a big thrill. It's like, whoa, Ivo Watts Russell, who was running for AD, uh, 
you know, he was a big black, knew about big black and stuff like that, and decided, wow, this would be a great approach to get Steve Albini. I'm Steve Albini, and I was the recording engineer for Surfer Rosa, the first album by the Pixies. So when he contacted me, it wasn't completely out of the blue, but it was pretty much out of the blue. Like, I hadn't done any records for his label at that point. I hadn't done very many records for anybody at that point. Most of the records that I had done as an engineer at that point were either my own band's records or people in within arm's reach of my own band, like my friends' bands, my friends' friends' bands, you know, other Chicago-affiliated bands, bands who I had met on tour or had some personal relationship with. So the the Pixies were unusual in that they were a band that I had no prior relationship with. Most of my contacts with bands that I would work with in the studio came directly from the band. Like the band called me on the phone and I was speaking to the band. This one was weird by another degree because my first interaction was actually with Ivo at the record label. And subsequently, they had a manager and I wasn't used to dealing with managers. So their manager contacted me. And I didn't actually speak to a, a legit pixie until I um, got to the studio in Boston. The night before we went into the studio, there was a kind of a cocktail hour, I guess you'd call it, where I met the band and we hung out for a bit, had dinner. I'm sorry, I genuinely don't remember anything about those conversations or what went down. Um, basically, I was just relieved that they were normal people, that they weren't arch and, you know, pretentious and that they seemed comfortable forming an aesthetic and sharing their opinions. They didn't seem to be even the slightest bit familiar with other records I had done or, you know, my band's music, that kind of thing that didn't seem like it had penetrated into their world at all. I didn't even know Big Black at the time. I really wasn't even familiar with this, with this stuff. I think maybe two years later, I got into Big Black and was like, whoa, I love Big Black. And then I saw him in an airport once. I go, Steve, I can't believe it. <laughs> I love your whole band. If my memory serves me right, it could have been the day before or the night before we met. And then we began the next day. Yeah, I mean, that's normal. Like, I'm steeled in the independent music scene and the punk scene and the underground you do everything by the seat of your pants. You do everything as quickly and cheaply as possible. You know, get in, spit on your hands, make the record and get out. You know, like that's my entire work ethic is kind of hardened into that way of thinking. So that that seemed totally normal to me. Like nothing seemed unusual about that scenario. In fact, the the schedule that we were given in the studio seemed lavish by my standards. Like having more than a week to make a record just seemed like an absurd luxury in my mind. He came in, the, and again, it was the same thing. It was, we were young and this was a big thrill, you know, a new studio and an actual producer. Yeah, he had little tricks up his sleeve and stuff, and he was very entertaining to uh, regale us, you know, while we were recording. He had a sense of humor. That's all that counted. You know, we don't want like a deadbeat in there. If he had a personality flaw that we did not like, we would have not even entered that room. He seemed like a normal guy, and we went at it. It was called uh, Q Division. Uh, it was a 16-track studio in Boston. And I think maybe because of Ivo, you know, putting two and two together, maybe Steve would be the best thing suited for this, for, for what we were doing. They were naturally good musicians, naturally gifted musicians. They were well-rehearsed. They were in great shape to make a record when we did it. So going into the studio, I wanted to prove my value 
to them because they would have had reason to be suspicious of me, not knowing me, not being familiar that much with the work that I'd done, and you know, basically taking their record label guy's word for it that I would be a good idea. So the first thing I did at the studio was assess the limitations of the studio. The studio had a very modest control room. It was a 16-track studio with a very modest console, not a lot of outboard equipment. I used that as an excuse to buy a piece of equipment that I had wanted, a digital reverb made by a company called Clark Technique. And so we had one of those reverbs at the studio. There was also a really great live room, like the acoustics in the live room at that studio were, were nice. One of the ways that I assess a studio when I first get there is to walk around in the live space and, you know, stomp my feet and clap my hands and whistle and see where the reflections are coming from and see what the ambient sound is like. And that room sounded great, lively and boomy. It had a great low end, had a relatively high ceiling. So I was pretty confident we'd be able to make it, at a minimum, make the drums sound good. Yeah, he brought in things like metal picks to play instead of plastic picks. So that was like a new thing to give it a little harder edge on some songs. And also another one of the tricks that he did was a, a thing, using a thing called a PZM mic. And a PZM mic is, uh, it's a placement zone microphone, like a sheet with a microphone placed sideways in it. And he mounted it on the wall in the actual studio in the big room. So it gives you, if you listen to Surferosa, you can hear that kind of ambiance, that kind of room sound. And that's really what that was. You know, even though the mic, the drums had microphones on them and close mics and overhead mics, that room mic back there gave it the, the real, the kind of live sound, which was something else. And because of that, I own a PZM today <laughs> because of that. At the time, I didn't have a lot of options for accurate ambient mics. I did have a pair of PZM microphones, which were reasonably flat. And so I ended up using those for the ambient mics on the drum kit. So we always had flexibility of more or less ambient sound. Yeah, I remember David's drums just acoustically sounding great and me thinking literally, if I can get a photograph of that onto the record, then we're done. There weren't any gimmicks production-wise. It was just really recorded honestly. That was an honest version of what we were. The idea for Surfer Rosa was just to document what we've done, you know, we need uh, someone to document it very well and have great recording technique. And he had that. There was a dearth of other isolation areas other than the main recording space. There was a corridor. So keeping the amplifiers out of the drum microphones involved isolating the bass amp and the guitar amps in that corridor. And the sound in there was not ideal. And also at the time, the Pixies were using these small portable combo amps, which were great for gigging and small clubs, but didn't have an impressive sound. So walking around in the physical space of the building, there was a corridor that led to a very large tiled bathroom that also had really great acoustics. So I suggested that we rent some bigger, more powerful amplifiers and isolate those in that tiled bathroom so we could get a bigger, more ambient sound on the guitars and they took that suggestion. We did physically put an amp in the bathroom to get a sound that he wanted in his head. And he'd put the microphone there too, for the drum sounds too. You know, it doesn't have to be, just there was always a microphone there. But uh, yeah, it was an interesting approach. I didn't go like, wow, that's a good idea. I was like, well, eh, you know, of course, why not? Let's just put it in there. I'm a little uncomfortable with that because that seemed like that was the first instance of me suggesting something to them and them acquiescing. And that sort of became a pattern. Like I would suggest something and they would say yes. That made me feel like I was having too big of an influence on the record. And that made me uncomfortable. As I mentioned previously, I wanted to prove my worth to them. And part of that involved me coming up with ideas that if they worked out, would validate them having brought me into the process.
ball machine is a good way to uh, just like introduce everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, David on drums, you know, at that time, Kim or Paz on bass, and then we all join in. It's also a good song to start for our uh, sound man because we don't do a sound check. So we will do that for him and we would extend it. And it's a great opener too, because every, everyone kind of knows it when, when we start a show. I can't say it was any, at least for Bone Machine, going about that, how it starts with drums and bass and then the guitars come in, how, it's, how that's structured. I mean, there wasn't any thought of how to do it. It just seems that's the way you do it, you know? So that's just an example of just what we're doing. It wasn't like a, any plan or anything. You know, when we started Bone Machine, when we started kind of Charles was coming around, you know, playing it so we could kind of figure it out. I was playing, you know, Bone Machine. If if you listen, it's like an Indian beat. It's backwards. I wouldn't call it Indian beat. I, that's not not going on that area. But it's ba da 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 ba da 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 ba da 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 ba instead of da da ga da 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 ga da 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 ga. Like every rock song there is is one two three four one two three four. But this was one two three four one two three four, and that was Charles's suggestion. Why don't you try this? Why don't you just play it on the one instead? Give it that ga 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 feel, and we did that and. That's Bone Machine. <laughs> that really makes it. Really, really does. And I think it's the only song that's out of tradition or or what that kind of oddity where it's like just turning it around, going on the one instead of the three. Everything else we do, I'm doing. I'm very mediocre. I just play it on the three. It's a regular rock beat. But Bone Machine is quite interesting. By the way, Bone Machine, it has a certain timing. Like if one of us falls off, you can't join back in. It's really more tricky than it sounds. Like if I fall off the train, that's it. I'm off. I'm either chasing it or they have to catch up to me. I can't even tell. You're just lost. You just, you're just lost. We have to stop it. We've stopped the, uh, that song numerous times because we didn't come in on time. And it's tough to correct. But the only thing is sometimes... I can get really lost on it because I'm doing that one, two, three, and I'm trying, and everyone else is playing the kind of the straight ahead, you know, one and three. I'm doing the backwards. So sometimes I'm like, oh, oh, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> it kind of, we got to stop the song, either start it again or go on to another song. That riff I came up with, I liked it. It just kept going and going and going, very relentless. The only thing unrelenting about it was I would switch from minor to major mode on one and it, every time i do that it kind of like, you know i forgot to do it live i started doing it like on the last tour because oh yeah that's what i did and now when i do it like ah, okay there's the joke there's always got to be some kind of joke you know with the uh, theorist proving the um you know you got to know how to break the rules right so that's how i was doing it and the song came together uh, well. I loved the solo that I did on that. Just really just one chord. It wasn't one note, but it was like a, a chord. <laughs> I just kept going and going and going. Basically making, again, a joke out of what a solo is, you know, at the time. Plus that chord, too, there was a hit by a guy named Prince kiss was the name of the song and he was hitting a ninth chord and that's what i i did it kind of like a tribute to that hit you're the bone machine couldn't get more of a chalk and cheese kind of a, an arrangement like Charles's delivery has this kind of a you know unhinged playful kind of babbling quality and Kim's 
vocal is so pure and so pretty and so precise. It's just such a, a stark contrast. It's it's kind of shocking that they were able to forge a synthesis between them because they are so diametrically opposite. I have the, the greatest respect for them for being able to synthesize a band identity out of such diametrically opposed aesthetics. Well, it's wonderful. I think that they're the yin and the yang. I think um, having... Uh Kim in the band, or a female compared to all those guys, it gave it a, a different sound, whether it be vocals or just how we were as a band. And it just works in vocals. Her, her background, uh, any kind of female vocals, just it just added to it. So Ferosa had a lot of harmonies, and they worked hard to do that. And I just witnessed it. You know, they had to do what they had to do. I was in my own head. I was just concerned about guitars, but the way it, it came out was great. So for Rosa was the way we bonded. We bonded. We didn't have that much time. We were still working odd jobs. So we would rehearse and play. That's the only time we really saw each other. We had this rehearsal space and we were really just, we were the only ones practicing diligently it seemed like everyone was just partying they were like maybe seven other rooms there yeah and then we would open up the door and they were listening to us <laughs> we were entertaining them with like this muffly sound you know they liked it you know that's when we knew we had something That was a song, unlike Bone Machine, Bone Machine was a little after the fact where we, I don't think we played it that much in the in the clubs, but Break My Body, we did play a lot. I think Break My Body was one of the early ones from around the Come On Pilgrim era. I think an early, early Pixie song. That we knew, like the songs now, they're like riding a bike. They're very, very easy to play. And it's funny because Break My Body, when I look back on it now, I love playing Break My Body. It was so easy and I was into it and doing that. Nowadays, I play it and I still love it. I love all the Pixie songs, but it's not as easy as it was when I was a kid. And it's really a simple song. It really is. But it's a little more thought that I have to put into it. And I have no idea why. I don't know. But Break My Body, I'm very familiar with it. We were all comfortable with the song. Break My Body was, you know, a very groovy song, heavily bass driven. You know, was busy and <laughs> I mean, not busy, but there were a lot of notes going on already. And um, I just put two notes on top of it. That's it. And the uh, chorus was very simple, too. I'm just trying to do the simplest as possible. I think the chorus was, uh, I think Kim suggested that, that riff or the holes in it. My main concern was the chord progression. And the subject matter that he's been picking is good because it's not, it wasn't being done enough. I should say that it wasn't being done enough. You know, we're not into Dear Diary lyrics because we don't give a flying fuck what you did last night, you know. I took to Charles's aesthetic very quickly. I liked the kind of ranting gibberish quality to some of his stuff, the sort of non sequitur lyrical imagery. All of that seemed, you know, instantly charming and appealing to me. The nuts and bolts of the songwriting seemed very straightforward to me, although distinctive and well executed. But I couldn't pinpoint a lineage. Like I couldn't have said, oh, yeah, this this band is obviously emulating this other band. Sephirosa, it solidified our sound. It really did. Sephirosa forever was, this is our mandala. 
this is our fingerprint. What we have done to Surferosa is what people would have just skipped over. You know, they would have just flew over it, whereas we just stopped and observed it and hung on to it. You know, we said hello. <laughs> you know, I could imagine bands having that initial thing with their ideas, but they would go on and embellish on it. We didn't. Yeah, I think a lot of bands would have just had that, could have had that if they just stopped at a certain moment, you know, because they, they have it. Uh, something against you yeah you know that's just a a good little ditty something against you remind me of the chords to passenger by iggy pop i think if you slowed it down if you slowed that thing down you would kind of go like oh okay it's the passenger you know it's not exactly like it but you could get the feeling that it will be you know <laughs> And then, uh, uh, what's the pass here? Oh, shit. I didn't know something up against you was on Preserver Rosa. That's, that shows you how much I remember of that. But all those songs, a lot of those songs, I, um, I mean, those were the punk kind of ones, the ones that were heavy. Yeah, that was just a batch of the, what we were about back then. I think that just heavy, that punk kind of thing. And I think a lot of the songs we have go from, you know, Charles had a lot of angst, and I think some of those songs were just heavy. A lot of the bands that I work with are sort of grunty, ugly, brutish bands. And uh, a lot of those bands like the vocal presence to be of a type with the other amplified instruments where they, part of their aesthetic is they like the sound of the amplified voice as opposed to the acoustic sound of a voice. In the same way, someone would prefer an electric guitar over an acoustic guitar. They prefer an amplified voice over an acoustic voice. And so I have developed a number of techniques for recording a vocal through an amplifier so that you get this kind of burned up quality. Something Against You was one of the more energetic songs, one of the more like biteier songs, and it seemed like a natural fit. Charles sang it through um, an amplifier with a bullet microphone. They look like headlights from back in the era when people used to have headlights outside of the car you know so that's how it was recorded i also think that that sound the sound of a vocal being roasted through a guitar amplifier if the singer is hearing that sound they can perform that as an effect almost and it creates an expressive option for them like you know if you swallow the mic you get more low end and you get more overload if you back off from the mic, you get a slightly clearer, slightly more nasal sound. If you cup the mic, you get a kind of a filtery effect. Like all of those little performance details, if you're putting that in the, into the hands of the vocalist, you can expect them to do something with it. Like you give them the expressive avenue, you can expect them to take it and do something interesting.
um, one happy prick at the end, which is <laughs> quite interesting. They came up in the studio, but live, no. But we play it pretty much, it could be almost every night. But that, I haven't heard it in a long time. I have to remind them, actually, on the reunion that that's what you're saying. You know, I am one happy prick. And the song is, is to me, when he said that, it had like, oh, I see. It had a little, it had a little meaning. You know, I have something against you. You know, it's your fucking dick. That's what I'm thinking. It's your prick. So at the end, it's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> yeah. I got a broken fist. I got a. I got a broken fist. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. That edit on Broken Face, I got a You cannot get that edit now because that was a tape shutting down. You know, digital doesn't do that. It won't do that. It will never, ever do that. So that's cool. You know, little timestamp on that song. Again, Steve Albini in the studio was, this was tape machines, was all before digital. So there was a lot of cutting and splicing. So I think part of the the beginning on the on broken face is just a lot of splicing that he did there are a lot of little quirks about studio practices like depending on the the way the tape machine works when you start or stop it it has a distinctive sound that's captured on the recording like the sort of starting up or stopping sound or you know the tape spooling off the reel all of those things are kind of failure modes in the studio but if you've worked in the studio, they become familiar. And I liked the idea of introducing those sounds and those eccentricities into the finished product, where normally you would take great pains to avoid having those kind of eccentricities on a record because they were, they're, like I said, they're sort of failure modes. It became a kind of an identifying feature of that record was that the sound of the session underway was part of the record. And it sort of became a thing, like a feature of the record was that you could hear the process of making the record and the interaction of the people and the personalities. And I think that's charming and that's the rationale for doing it. was another kind of punk song. I know that we played it around and we kind of had that one down a lot earlier or we knew we were a little more confident with Broken Face compared to maybe something against you. And later on, people loved that, uh, loved that lyric, I got a broken face. I mean, it's biblical reference, you know. So he wasn't writing anything about what he did last night. <laughs> Or what it's planned. So it was all biblical uh, references. We're cool with that. You know, the Bible has great stories. So I'm told. Never picked it up. I found out after the fact that when Charles was younger, he was into the Christian rock, the burgeoning Christian rock movement. And in particular, a guy named Larry Norman, who I was familiar with because I, I, there was an exchange student that stayed at my house when I was a kid in high school who was into all of that Christian music. And I had gone to see Larry Norman and he was like the one guy in that scene who wasn't just tragic. Like his music actually kicked a little bit of ass and he was an interesting performer. And I thought it was notable that Charles would bring that part of his earlier identity in music into the Pixies who were not making Christian music. This 
I know His teeth as white as snow What a gas it was to see him Walk her every day into a shady place I remember writing on a Sharpie on a rehearsal space that it's something to the effect that uh, when you're not making a sound, you are actually being heard. So that's the uh, key there. And I liked it. I always liked when we were um, putting together the songs and I hear the rhythm section. Oh, God, I could listen to this forever. You know, this is really cool. So, you know, you got to let it happen. You got to let the audience have that joy, too. And uh, any time that can happen, we'd let it happen because it's really hypnotic. The Pixies were absolutely part of that developing aesthetic of intimacy then exploding into, like, drama. Like, they were definitely part of that aesthetic. I don't think it's dumb to call them a quiet to loud band. I think that's perfectly reasonable. They weren't the only ones, you know, it's not a novel idea, but it was definitely a trend. Trend makes it sound capricious. It, it, that's not what I mean. It was definitely an aesthetic that was sort of sprinkled here and there throughout the music scene, beginning in the middle to late 80s. We already had that going anyway, but uh, yeah, the dynamic, I mean, when he comes in, just the way he mixed it, the dynamics really worked just because, you know, he had perfect recording chops. There developed an aesthetic that allowed for small, intimate sounds, which then exploded into big, enveloping sounds. That I am associated with it is a temporal artifact of the fact that I was working in the studio with some of these bands who had that as their aesthetic. Like... I did a Slint record that had a lot of quiet to loud dynamics. I did a Pixies record that had a lot of quiet to loud dynamics. I did a PJ Harvey record that had quiet to loud dynamics. That's not me, that's them. I do think that I am given significance in sonic elements that are none of my doing. And the, the quiet loud, quiet loud dynamic is definitely one of those. That's what the bands were doing on their own left to their own devices, that was their aesthetic. And my job was to try to make that happen in somebody else's living room. With a lip she said, Gigantic. Charles had the um, chorus, and he wanted Kim to sing it and do the lyrics. And the songs where Kim's vocal is prominent have a completely different tone and mood, despite it being the same band, to the songs, the sort of more frenetic songs that Charles is leading. Gigantic was definitely, it's, uh, it was a Kim song. It was uh, the female, female portion singing. But it's a nice change. I think that anything, whether it be, you know, gigantic or if it was La La Love You or something, it's a nice little, it's a little change. It makes dynamics a little different than having the same thing all, all. I'm not downplaying or saying anything bad, but it just gives it a little more dynamic, I think. So it was always a highlight, and the crowd always loved hearing Gigantic. Kim Deal has just one of the, the most beautiful, natural singing voices ever on Earth. Like, top five singing voices on Earth. My friend and bandmate Bob Weston has described Kim's vocal style as, it sounds like she's smiling when she's singing. And that's really true. You can hear this like sort of angelic sweetness in her voice sometimes. But then she she uses her voice to like like open up on some very dark themes and some kind of creepy, you know, suggestively sexual stuff. And it's like a nice contrast, but it's also like it kind of gives you the willies like you should, maybe this is something I shouldn't be allowed to listen to right now. 
I think she's got a really effective vocal presence. Uh, a lot of her vocals were recorded either directly into a mic. A Sennheiser 421 was the mic. That's a very bright, very crispy, very present mic. So the vocals of hers that were meant to be very up close and whispery and intimate were recorded directly into the 421, literally as close as she could get to it. The ones that were meant to be spooky and atmospheric were recorded in the toilet at a distance. And she sang it just like that at David's garage. Uh, it was, um, you know, she was very bashful at first with it. And I could understand why, but, you know, it was filling the space. The chorus was there. The subject matter was interesting. I think initially Kim said that, uh, it was going to be about a mall, you know, big, big mall. Hmm. That would have been interesting. Just in general, there's, there's nobody I admire in music more than Kim. Like the records that she's made with the breeders, I think are each one is distinctive and unique and absolutely masterful at executing the sound in her head. She is the most relentless in pursuit of a very specific sound or idea of anyone I've ever worked with. She does not care if it takes years and tens of thousands of dollars to exercise the demon of this sound in her head. But once she's got it, she recognizes it instantly and the case is closed. I think that kind of tenacity developed over time. She definitely didn't behave that way in the Pixies on that first, my first exposure to her. She was very much willing to try anything, very much willing to go with what the consensus was on decision-making. Super competent as a bass player. Like, I think she's a generally very good musician and playing bass seemed like a trivial task to her but she didn't feel demeaned by it. She just saw that as her role. It's like, I'm going to play bass in this band, so I'm going to knock it out of the park. That had like a definitely a velvet underground um, influence, you know. Sweet Jane would be the uh, reference to that. It came together pretty good. Gigantic was a fun song to play out live. I think we knew that very well before going into the studio. The only thing I remember about it, I got a brand new China symbol. They sound like a garbage can kind of thing, and that was the first song that I used it on. Uh, on Gigantic, where at the end, there's these little crashes that keep happening during the choruses or something like that, and that's what got employed. And the funny thing about that was when we, our next producer was Gil Norton, and Gil Norton hated China cymbals. With the Gil Norton records that we did, I don't think you're going to hear a China cymbal on it, <laughs> but on Surfer Rosa, you hear the China cymbal. <laughs> Steve Albini put uh, an amp in the bathroom to differentiate maybe it's from other songs. I think it was my PV amp. Yeah, we had Marshalls too, but the PV sound made it on that album that was pushed in a lot. I like the sound of it, you know? 
I think it might have been called the Bandit, and it had the uh, saturation um, control, which was cool. And also that amp was very portable. I can, uh, you know, haul it around different gigs. The basic track recording was done with their stage gear, which was these small amplifiers. And Joey had a little PV amplifier, like, you know, the size of a Kleenex box, that kind of little crappy combo amp. And that does have a really biting sound. And we used that on for some of his leads where he wanted a really crispy, really dry, raspy sound. But for the burlier stuff, for the heavier stuff, we use the rented marshals in the the big tiled toilet. My favorite moment still is the uh, is uh, River Rio Fades. I love the uh, vocals in the beginning when they're going right, 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 and uh, they're doing it until they're pretty much running out of breath. River Rio Fades when we play it now, when that part comes up, when it's righty, 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 right, and they're, they're both going, whether it be Paz or it was Kim or or whenever they're doing it. I have really got to turn that off in my head. And the reason why is because I'm trying to keep this beat. And when they do that righty righty, it's not always in time. It's a little kind of, it's kind of a little jaunty like that. And that throws me for a loop. If I start hearing that, I got to, oh, no, no. And so I always on Review Freddy's, I have to sit there and count. During that part, one, two, I'm just counting in my head so I don't get thrown off the beat. Guitar part-wise, you know, I'm bending up. I'm hitting so many intervals on the way up, you know. I just love the way the guitar, when it goes out of tune, because it has this, like, natural, like, tremolo, you know. And it becomes a sawtooth pattern, which I uh, like. So it, it becomes a synthesizer at that point, you know. You know, you're just doing sound design. And it does, uh, that guitar part does reach unison and then I go back down, you know, but it has to hit that unison at a particular point. I forgot when, but uh, then I go back down to uh, dreamland or nightmare for Berkeley students. <laughs> I'm not normally an advocate for multiplying band members that is doubling parts that are played organically by one person i'm not normally an advocate for that because often i feel like it's done as a defensive measure you know well that sounds kind of dull let's double it and see if it sounds special yeah i guess it sounds special let's leave it you know like that that seems like a lazy approach to making a record in joey's case as mentioned he had this kind of feeble pv amp that he used for the basic tracking and we had access to the fancy marshals for the overdubs. So that gave us a natural experiment of playing the song with the marshal and see if it sounded better. And if it did, we could use that. And But if not, we had the original take that was done on the PV. And then as a byproduct of that, you have these moments where you have two versions of Joey on those songs where it seemed like the guitar sounded 
thin with the original guitar. Joey would do a run on the Marshall and then we could compare them, play them simultaneously, see what it sounded like. One thing I noticed immediately about Joey's lead guitar style was that he wasn't like hung up on the sort of bluesy scalar stuff that a lot of other guitar players sort of gravitate to. He had more of an ear toward abstraction and sound effects and stuff like that. I listened to a lot of surf music because I knew it was going to serve me well because I don't sing. <laughs> so instrumentals were uh, really the key to me to uh, listen to. And, you know, there's a trick to not to get in the way. You know, you got to be heard, but not get in the way. It's really, really, really uh, a tricky, tricky little job. Joe is a lot of the sound of the Pixies, his guitar. I think it's very distinctive the way he plays, and I have no explanation how he does it, but it works. It's, it's perfectly apropos. For Where's My Mind, Joe's guitar, it's... It's just typical Joe. I can't, I cannot explain it. It's just, whether it be simple or whether it be hard, whatever he has has a certain Joe sound to it. And um, what he gets for each song, I think it really is very distinctive Pixies. Stop. Charles moved in with his girlfriend. We just decided he moved out. We were making enough. We got established so we can afford our own apartments now. But he showed it to us, all of us. And I didn't do much to it other than that was the first riff that it came to mind. You know, I knew I wanted to do that. Yeah. Then and then, then and then I knew I wanted to like, that was it. That's the only thing I wanted to do. And it sounded good. I said, I'm done. That's it. Cool. My job's done with this song. <laughs> Where Is My Mind, I think, is one of the songs that we kind of honed on the road rather than in the studio. I actually don't recall why it's so simple as far as even my drums. It's just done. Uh, and then there might be a cymbal, a uh, hi-hat. Where Is My Mind is, is interesting, though, because when we reunited... In 2004, I played everything because it was like riding a bike. It was very easy to do. We weren't doing any new material. It was all our old laurels that we were playing, all those old songs. And Where's My Mind? I mean, I can't think of a simpler song. Cactus might be as simple as that. But with Where's My Mind, it goes, bum, bum, ka, bum, bum, ka, bum, bum, ka, bum, bum, ka. And there's a, there's a little hi-hat thing. So anyway, 2004 comes around and we're on the road, we're playing all these shows and we're doing Where's My Mind every night. And I didn't realize it, but someone said to me, I think it was maybe, oh, I guess a year into playing, you're not doing that symbol, that little symbol opening that happens throughout the song. And I was like, what? <laughs> and I had to listen to Where's My Mind to, to realize, oh, you, I've completely forgot about that. <laughs> so. Yeah.
my snare hits in the past and even today, I play hard. I definitely changed my drumming for the Pixies. Coming from a different background of the way I played, uh, it was getting too busy. The fills were just stupid fills that shouldn't be there or fills all the time. So that had all changed just to cater to the music or the, what we were playing. And again, the Pixie songs were stuff that I never played before. That kind of, a lot of these punk things or halftime stuff, and that was all new to me. So it was a wonderful experience as far as learning how to play that or just trying to cater to what had to be done. I'm not a muso by any means. I'm, I'm a theorist, but I know enough of it, you know. So he's hitting an E, and then I'm in a major mode, then he goes to minor mode. I'm still there. I'm still hitting those two notes. I mean, it's just, just, you know, little tricks like that. That solo, okay. That solo, someone pointed out to me, was because uh, it sounds right to my ears. It, it's a B major chord, and I'm doing the minor mode over it. It just sounds right. I'd like to do it properly and see how it sounds. <laughs> Probably not going to be good, or I just have to get used to it. Yeah, it was just a, a good solo. And, and when there was going to be a solo thing, I remember suggesting, let's just, please, for the love of God, if I'm going to have a solo, let's just have one chord. <laughs> you know? That way I don't have to think. And obviously I didn't think about it hard enough because I was playing in the wrong mode. Well, I think Where's My Mind, it, it, it's definitely surprising because it's at the time it was just, I don't even know if it was a single. I, I don't think it was. I, I don't recall. But um, I would blame Fight Club. Um, you realize the power of a movie or how that's changed that song or at least given a new, a new generation or, or people who know us only from from that song or just being aware of it from that media. And that that was astounding. Jesus, it's everywhere, huh? Where's My Mind was in an Apple commercial. You know, fuck, yeah, I had no... I mean, people told me that it was in a big commercial, but I didn't know it was Apple. Fight Club, that was great. That was a good one. I don't know if you gave it to any other movies. I think it just belongs in Fight Club. I don't think we should really share that i mean you know i'm not charles but i think we it should be a fight club song and it's grown ever since uh it's become bigger and bigger and bigger and i think it, it's a song that we we have to play along with some of the other ones that we do but definitely where's my mind is in there so at the end of that song the tape actually ran out on the take where they were doing a, a vamp at the end that they were intending to fade out and the tape ran out so you hear the band end stop abruptly at the end. And as a way of masking that, I created a reiteration of Kim's backing vocal just by soloing her backing vocal, her woo-woo backing vocal through the reverb and recording several instances of that and spliced those onto the end. So you have this... So the effect is that this ethereal voice is insistent and unstoppable, but the the band like glitch stops and the woo-woo continues, you know, Kim Deal unstoppable by machinery. Cactus, it's one of the few t 
times I listen to the lyrics and I like it, you know. I like the fact that uh, he wanted his girlfriend to um, put blood on a shirt, but in a very specific way with a cactus. Cactus, uh, I suggested spelling it out, spelling uh, Pixies out, as a nod to T-Rex, because T-Rex did that, and it kind of sounded like a T-Rex song. So let's just do a tongue-in-cheek and spell our name. The champ, the, the P-I-X-I-E-S. I don't know if that was originally the way it was or a suggestion. It was That's tough to recall, but I know that that's my job. Every show is I'm the one with the P-I-X-I-E-S. And it was tough for a while because I'm, this shows you how how I get by just barely. It's bum bum ka bum bum ka P-I-X-I-E-S. I'm trying to say that and still keep in time. I know it's easy as heck, but it, it's not. It's not. But I'm able to pull it off. Yeah, when David Bowie covered Cactus, that was that was something else. That was something else. I mean, wow. Big influence, David Bowie, uh, uh, for us, you know. Not only that, but as a producer of uh, Iggy Pop. But for him to do uh, that was very mind-boggling. It really was. It was just like fucking David Bowie covering and doing a cactus that's just crazy phil you know that's that's a good nod we were Bowie fans and he was a fan of the pixies and um when he did cactus that was a big thrill that was a thrill in fact when we did a there was a benefit after bowie had passed in new york for something i forget what it was but it was just a, a bowie big thing in new york and we went and Everyone was playing a Bowie song. We went on, we played Cactus because Bowie played, he played, he played Cactus. So we got away with playing our own song at a benefit that everyone was doing covers like that. So, so that was, that was a thrill. That was our welcoming to uh, the music world. He welcomed us. He was like, come out, you know, you guys, by the way, with your low self-esteem, is part of the musical community now. And he wanted to uh, advertise us, too. He thought that uh, we weren't um, big in America, and we weren't. We weren't at that time, partly because we toured uh, Europe a lot more. In the immediate term, the Pixies were not a big band. In America in particular, they were not a particularly well-known band. They got more well-known in Europe, and then their fame in Europe filtered into the American underground scene through avenues of people who were buying English and European music. You know, people who would have every record on 4AD would also have a Pixies record. And eventually, more sort of normal music fans crossed paths with it and took a liking to it. But their success in the U.S. was not meteoric like they were much more popular much quicker in england and europe than they were in the u.s it took a while for them to to catch on over here 
And in the underground scene, there was a, a suspicion of bands that were sort of foisted on the audience top down. Like, here's a band that arrives fully formed with a uh, label backing and uh, a big tour that you've never heard of, that you know nothing about, that, you know, they've never been written about in the zines. You've never heard anybody speak their name in your uh, word of mouth circles. Just this band appears out of nowhere with the backing of the industry. That Those bands were met with suspicion in the underground. And rightly so. Almost all of those bands were atrocious. The Pixies were an exception in that they were a working band in Boston who just didn't develop much of a following. And they caught the ear of an influential record label and things snowballed from there. So they came by their success and their adulation legitimately. They weren't a manufactured phenomenon in the way that some of these other bands were. This is a song about a superhero named Tony. It's called Tony Thing. Tony's theme, I think, it was one of the earlier ones. Uh, not extremely early, but it was a, one of the first ones, I think, that before a lot of the other songs on Surferosa. I think it was very easy to record because I think we knew it pretty well. We played it out. <laughs> That's a fun one. I love bicycles. I'm a cyclist. So to hear that, and Tony's a brother of mine, and Ed's a brother of mine, too. Jesus, he's a, what is he doing? Um, so... I loved it, you know, that simple riff. Well, he's doing he's doing that boogie woogie thing, and I'm just doing this angry thing on top of it. But it came together very well, and uh, yeah, I like the uh, introduction a lot. Today's interesting because I'm I'm getting older, and it's like all those little fast songs, not the punk songs, but the ones that are da 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 with a lot of eighth notes. It's a lot more work than it was years back, but it's fun to play. The, the audience likes that, and um, it's kind of a crazy song. It's one of the songs that I like playing because it's kind of, it's like Vamos. It's a fun song, or Nimrod's song is a fun song to play. Tony's theme is is the same. It's just uh, when it goes down to Joe's solo, and then it goes back, and then finally Tony, when it jumps on the end. It's just... It's fun. It's fun. It's, it's just the way the song is built as far as drums and the way it changes. I, I, I'm a fan of. Oh my golly, and that was a tough one. Oh my golly was a tough one. Because the beginning is dun 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 it's this weird to me it's weird. To the rest of the band, they had no problem doing it. But I it was a nightmare trying to figure out that timing. And because of it, I think, I don't think that we played Oh My Golly a lot. We might have done it at the time when Surfer Rosa was released. But that song kind of fell a little by the wayside, now, especially in 2004 when we got back together. We never played it. And it wasn't until we had to do the Surferosa 30-year anniversary, and now it's the 35, that we had to relearn it. And I just learned how to do, um, how to write words to beats. So I don't like roast beef or whatever. I don't, I don't know what I wrote, but I had it written on my toms for Oh My Golly. So I could just, don't eat me that the boo too dead. I would I would recite these words. And that was the only way by reading it I could pull that beat off. And I knew it went six rounds, because I had the, I had it written six times. <laughs> the same words. And then I read the sixth. Then I look at pause and I just that's the end, and that's where we go into the song. But oh my golly, it's not an easy one.
Sofa Rosa had Spanish uh, lyrics on it coming from an American band. That's, uh, you know, it's a shtick, you know. Plus, Charles was, is very fluent in Spanish. It's very impressive. So it made a lot of sense for him to um, flex that muscle. Yeah, just being in Puerto Rico, Charles, I could imagine by himself in a strange land and just working on lyrics, perhaps learning the language and misinterpreting it and, you know, coming up with his own interpretations. I, I could see him playing with words down there. Charles's Spanish, it just gave it a different flavor on some of the songs, him doing that. And I think it made us popular in South America as well, just because <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. But um, I know some of it was Spanglish as well, so we, you've got a lot of correction on, on fixing stuff. But it's nice. It's, it's, it's part of that Pixies style, I guess. Oh my golly, I have my guitar all tuned to an E on that one, every single string. I want to make it sound like a, like a bumblebee. So we did it. I'm always bashful about making suggestions, you know, but I remember doing that, saying it to Steve Albini that I, I wanted to have all the, the strings tuned to E. And then he reminded me to do it. I go, oh, okay, all right, let's try it. And we tried it. I had the slide, and it was entertaining. I said, you fucking die. No, I, 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 we were just goofing around. Don't touch my stuff. I think that, that might have been a joke that we had in the band. You can't touch my stuff. No, you can't. You know, I remember that. The interactions between Charles or Kim speaking, that was just the tape rolling, and Steve Albini didn't tell us, but just put it on put it in with the the mixes. And I don't, I don't know, it worked. It made it different. It made it a little more personal, I think, in some way. Or, But that was something, I think, all Albini, just throwing it in there and surprising us. I was coming up with ideas for them on the spot. On reflection, in the end, I feel like some of those ideas are kind of intrusive. Things like, while the band was like doing takes, the guide vocal microphones that Charles and Kim had, those were being recorded because their their banter, their interaction was charming. So I just set up a quarter inch machine and started recording their talkback mics. And those little conversational snippets ended up being edited into the record. And that was another bright idea of mine that they acquiesced to. And again, I felt weird about it at the time, but it also... In the end, it seemed to validate itself. The banter between Charles and Kim on this album, it's very unique. I don't think I've heard of a band ever doing that. But that's, uh, he always had uh, a DAT machine, digital audio tape, this thing that just kept going in the background. You know, those cassettes are cheap. So it just, it just records and um yeah he put that in i thought it was funny you know and sometimes you can't get the reference because he's talking to a microphone there's not really a dialogue per se you're just hearing one side of the story 
So that's that's kind of surreal. I think it sounded cool. It was kind of interesting. I think that idea, I don't think anyone complained or there wasn't any, I don't think there was any discussion on it. It was just, yeah, this, this is pretty neat. And plus, again, you know, we're a baby band with a producer and it was, you know what you're doing. <laughs> Over time, like those little conversational snippets started to weigh on me. Like I felt like the band were constantly having to answer for some stupid gimmick that I had hung on their record. And I think it's, it shows a lot of grace on their part that they don't hate me intensely for it. <laughs> I know uh, Vamos was done on Common Pilgrim, and then we did it again for Surfer Rosa. I think a few songs, I think, were carried over for Surfer Rosa. Vamos, I think, along with Nimrod's son and Ed is Dead, I think those three were kind of the core songs that we played around Boston a lot that were fun to play, and I think they represented the Pixies a lot as far as that music. I think that was very definitive for what we were. Yeah, Ivo wanted to uh, re-record it. That's a weird one to uh, re-record. Perhaps maybe he saw us live and, you know, want to get that feel of um, the live thing. Yeah, vamos, those quick uh, little slidey things. It's fun. It was fun to do, you know. My fingers have gone through some burn marks at times. If I don't do it properly, I, I get a burn mark on it. And it's, it's pretty permanent. Yeah, that's the song that gives me the calluses. On the song Vamos, for example, he did a solo that was conventionally a bunch of quick slurred notes, and they'd already released that song, and I suggested that they do an extended version of it where the solo could be extrapolated on, and, and we could do an, a, like a weirder and, and more perverse version of the solo. So when they got to the solo section of the song, they just extended that by many iterations and Joey did many, many extemporaneous variations on his playing style where he was like making noises and chirpy sounds and various effects on his guitar. And then on playback, they made a little menu of the parts that they liked the best and we edited the solo together. So we spliced a lot of things up, you know, made weird noises. I threw tennis balls at it, at the guitar, you know made scraping sounds, anything. I was just trying not to make it sound like a guitar. It's very random. I don't know what I do. You know, it just, whatever it is, is an anti-guitar solo. That was uh, Kim's gold top guitar. And then uh, she wanted it back. I think she was getting very concerned that I was going to ruin it on Vamos because that solo on Vamos, I got kind of go shithouse on. 
and uh yeah rightfully so i uh i have a special guitar for vamos that i could kind of ruin you know mm, not ruin i don't really ruin them but it, you know they're gonna get physically abused when joe plays his solo during vamos um it's fun because I think it's entertaining for us. If Joe feels like he's going to have fun that night, it's entertainment. You just sit there and just watch. Yeah, I'm not trying not to watch, but I'll I'll be watching what he's doing. And what's interesting about it is, you know, Vamos is it's for depending on Joe's solo, it could be five minutes long. That's the song. And when he's doing that, I'm just I'm just doing this. And I've had so many people look at me, even the band, like you. Oh, it must be killing you. You're, you're, you know, it's you got to keep doing that, keep doing that. But the thing is, Vamos is one of the most easy songs to play because even though it's like this, I can't explain it. It's just like a halftime. I could just keep going all day with that, and so it's very easy to play Vamos. And I, I have, it's probably one of my favorite songs to play. I think I put too much pressure on myself to do that, you know? Yeah, I put too much pressure on t into it. And uh, right now I'm trying to find something else that I could do to the guitar that I haven't done, you know? I used to put it on a guitar stand so it would be truly a guitar solo, you know? And I tell the uh, lighting guy, don't even, like, light me, just light the guitar, and I could... Uh, make it feedback, you know, play with the modulation, tremolo, my wah, and you can do a whole slew of things with that thing, you know, and it's a guitar solo. <laughs> The concluding part of the solo was done as a tape collage where he literally just made random sounds with his guitar on quarter inch tape. And we did another little editorial listen. And I remember Kim having like a stenographer's pad that had nicknames for each of the sounds and the order in which she thought they should appear. Like this one should be a backwards zip and then a then the two piddly piddlies and then the ding dong, and then then the final kablam, you know, that sort of thing. And so then, then that tape collage was assembled, or it wasn't a collage, it was sort of a sequence, was assembled, and then that was played onto the master as the concluding bit of the solo. So the bulk of the solo is Joey playing his guitar. There's a bit at the end, which is Joey playing his guitar onto quarter-inch tape, which was then assembled into a collage and burned onto the tape in lieu of a live performance. When we redid Vamos, we did the whole song, and then we had to, I forget what we were doing, an editor or something, but he had erased the entire end of Vamos while we were in the studio. So it was going up to a point where Joe's solo was, and then it just disappeared, it was gone. So we had to, I think we played it again, or he found another old mix or something like that because the other one was missing and we spliced them together. So we spliced that part which was missing to that. So if you listen attentively to the Surferosa Vamos and you're sitting there and you listen, you're gonna hear at one point the frequency goes up. It's like and that's where the edit is. And it's just the end of the song, but it's just an interesting Pixies thing that happened in the studio. So there were two takes of the song. There was one take that was the proper take. And then there was a, a take that was just them reiterating the solo vamp for Joey to solo over. So the final master was a multi-track edit, which was the bulk of the song from the original take. Then the solo section, which was spliced in. There's one kind of interesting thing. If you listen carefully to the solo section, the song is in... I want to say the song is in 4-4, four, four, 
But because of the way that the edit worked out with the little extemporaneous noises that Joy was doing, there's one measure in the middle, which is in six beats instead of four. And that sort of inverts the rhythm that David was playing. So like the rhythm is going along normally. And then there's this one bar that has two extra beats in it. Then the rhythm is inverted from there until the end of the song. Uh, and then that's just a byproduct of me doing the splicing, probably unintentionally. I, although I, I remember David bringing it to our attention and everybody listening to it and saying, yeah, no, that's fine. And then the, the coda of the song, like the outro of the song was spliced on to the end of this assembled solo section. When we record, there's always banter going on. There's other things going on. You know, we just don't say one, two, three, four. That's not all we do in the studio. We have fun. We we make light of things. We talk. So it's good to hear that. It is really good to uh, introduce us as a band that has fun. Awesome. Fuck them at school. All I know is that there were... <laughs> There were rumors he was into field hockey players. There were rumors. So I applied, basically. He was gone the next day. I went day. off the team. It's like, <laughs> he was gone. They just like, it was like so hush-hush. They were so quiet about it. And then the next thing you know... I had been rebelling against the conventions of album presentation. Like all the songs are short, neat little packages that are separated by three seconds of silence. And, you know, you have your hits up front on side A and then you put the trash on side B. Like there are conventions of the structure of an album that I was kind of bristling at. And one of them was this idea of having the little silences between the songs. I liked the idea of having a bridge from one song to the next. And there were several records that I made during that period that embodied that. There's a Pussy Galore record, there's a Slint record, and this Pixies record that all have these little interludes or interstitial moments between songs or linking songs together or songs that segue one into the other, things like that. That was a conceit that I brought with me and applied to the band. And you know, the more time away from something you have about something like that, the more you think about other implications of it. And it made me feel like I was trying to claim authorship of some aspect of that record by insinuating myself into these decisions and choices and sort of themes on the record. And I grew very uncomfortable with that. And and one of the things that sort of spurred what I consider a maturation of my work practices as an engineer and I feel like I have made better records since by removing myself more from the creative decisions involved in making the record. The banter that was going around that was being recorded had no idea or you wouldn't think at the time that was going to be content, but um, it ended up being. And um, yeah, I don't know, it makes it makes Silver Rosa quite interesting, I think. And um, at least during the the 30 year and maybe the 35 year anniversary, we're trying to do it verbatim. We're trying to have that discussion, you know, to just to make it exactly like it is. So it's fun to do that. Ding, ding, ding. 
on I'm Amazed, the guitar part that I have kind of slows down the song, you know, bam, 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 because everyone else is kind of like doing this fast, furious thing, right? I'm Amazed was definitely an earlier song. And it's also, I've always said this over the years, is it's, it's I think, a minute 30, somewhere around there, a minute, just under a minute something. And the way I explain I'm Amazed is, well, if you like it, it'll leave you wanting more. If you don't like it, it's over before <laughs> before you know it. Rick is Red. Steve Albini initially wanted that, just like, let's just keep it as an instrumental. It's cool. It's also, that's a pentatonic scale. I know I make fun of the uh, blues scale a lot, but that is just straight up. Every note is on the pentatonic. I hit all five of them. <laughs> that's how I know. And it's, uh, it's that shape. It's the first shape that you learn as a kid. Brick is Red is a fun one to play because of that. And then come back into it. It's a, it's a blast to play. It's, and it's, it's another Pixie song that's quite different than some of the other ones, but um, it's Pixies. I also like the, um, what I'm doing for the chorus on that. It's odd. I'll tell you how I did it, how I came up with that interval. It was because I was watching... David Letterman, and Will Lee did this sound that, like, like he was clearing his throat. But he did it unison, those two chords. He was doing that. So oh, that's that's cool. Let me just, you know, I'm not going to make a hem sound on it, but, you know, that interval over the chords, it's really good. It just it sounds like a question mark. The whole time was a question mark. My practice was always to do that thing as a group effort and to put the sequence together and play it through and see what people thought. So I'm sure we did that. And then the little interstitial things were either conceived of as the introduction to a song or the or, or an addendum at the end of a song. So those interstitial things traveled with the songs that they were already associated with. I remember really liking the record, feeling very satisfied when we finished the record. There was one long drony abstract song on there that was a kind of a experimental move that Charles was championing and I remember having a taking a phone call from Ivo where he, where he said I don't remember the name of the song I want to say that it was called gouge my eyes out or gouge away or something like that I know that they had a song called gouge away I don't know if that's the same song but there was a a long meandering drony song that was sort of interrupted one side of the record. Um, it was like kind of an obstacle on one side of the record. I was kind of into that conceptually. I kind of liked the idea that you'd had interrupting the flow of an album with this thing that people had to get through to get to the, the jazzier bits, you know? And I know that Charles had affection for that song just as a piece. And I remember getting a phone call from Ivo saying that he couldn't conceive of the album including that song. Like, he just thought it was such a scar that he, he wanted to put his foot down and say, you can't put this song out. And that seemed out of character for him. And it's also the kind of thing that if it were my band, I would have told him to go fuck himself, you know? But yeah, I think in the end, the band did take that song off the record. When he started mixing it and we were, were listening to it, we were there the whole time on the mix process. It was amazing when we listened to it back in the speakers. It was just like, we love it. I love this. Oh, it's fantastic. I remember uh, 
I mean, we, you definitely hear Surfer Rosa. We heard it in the studio, in the control room when we, when we were recording it. It wasn't until months later when 480 came to visit us and they brought the actual record. And they brought it to Kim's apartment. So it was the first time actually seeing, and I think that we actually played Surfer Rosa on a record player. And that was a thrill because it was it was so different. It was our first real record. I mean, when, when you think of Come On Pilgrim, which was 4AD put that out, but those were demo tapes that we did. We did a demo tape and that turned into a record. But now we, we went for the first time into a studio with a real producer and had a real, uh, like, Vaughn Oliver. I mean, I mean, he did Come On Pilgrim as well, but he designed this crazy cover for Surfer Rosa. We were just, you know stunned looking at it it was it was something else it was a big 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 treat you know speaking for myself i'm also thinking like i hope we pissed some people off with this one you know in a sense like why didn't we think of this you know those moments you know like it, it could be anything inventions a jacket a tire whatever well you know <laughs> it's too late for the tire <laughs> but uh why didn't i think of this why didn't i think of that you know I can't credit any one record as being pivotal, really, for me, but I mentioned that they were one of the first bands that I worked on who weren't already friends or associates. So that marked a kind of a development for me in terms of my professionalism as an engineer, not having to merely rely on the people who were already in my Rolodex, you know? And I know that that record did catch the ear of other people who then contacted me because they liked the sound of that record. So I'm grateful for that, you know, on a base level of getting more work out of it, which seems kind of cheap, but I, I do appreciate that. When they first started to become more well-known in the U.S., a lot of people in underground circles were suspicious of them. They were a bit naive about the workings of the music industry, I guess, is the way the way you'd put it. And they seemed very credulous. And I talked about that a little bit with respect to me influencing the album by making suggestions and them acceding to all of my suggestions. Um, I wrote some rather glib and unflattering things about that in a fanzine in the immediate aftermath of that record. And I, I'm ashamed of the way I treated them. They didn't deserve that. Every now and again, I have cause to hear the Pixies album that I worked on in context somewhere. Like I'm in a bar and a song will come on or I'm watching a movie and a song will come on. And I think it's a better record than I thought it was at the time. At the time, I had all of these like conflicting intellectual perspectives on it and I couldn't just listen to it for its effect. And now when I hear it as a finished record, I think it sounds very good. And I think the band sound very good. And I don't find a lot to criticize. Sephiroza was, I think, just another another step in where we were as, as the Pixies. I mean, we started out with Come On Pilgrim. Sephiroza, we were doing this and then kind of increasing in popularity. And I think Sephiroza was the one that really, that really opened us up to Europe and the rest of the world. I think people became more aware of Sephiroza. And because of that, it just made us a, a more of a working band and in popularity as well. And it just afforded us the opportunity to do Doolittle and Bossa Nova and Trump Lamone and then keep going on. It's a joy to play it because all those early records are like riding a bike. They're kind of in there. It's unlike a new song. And new songs I know and you can play them and stuff like that. But those old ones like riding a bike... It's almost like second nature. You can just you can just go on autopilot and not think about a thing, which is nice. And that's what Surfer Rosa can do, I think more so 
than Doolittle or even Trump Lamone or even Bossa Nova or any album later. They're just, they're more built into us. We got lucky. We got lucky because we worked hard being lucky. You yeah. know, I guess now that we were talking about it, about Surferosa, it really started us. That was it. Like I said, it'll always be in the back of our minds when we're writing songs. We will always have it. Do not worry. We will <laughs> always have that sound. But we're not going to do the same damn album again. We're not going to make that. But you could hear it. You could hear it from our latest record. There's going to be a hint of it. We always have to do a nod to it. You know? It's like, don't forget, what made us special was that record. Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Pixies. You'll also find a full transcript of this episode and a link to purchase Surferosa. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.